From the early 30s to the late 50s, people with mental illness were commonly institutionalized due to our societal intolerance. It wasn't long before these mental health hospitals or institutions began to take on a negative stigma. There was widespread talk about the institutions becoming places of torture and experimentation. Doctors would use patients as guinea pigs for new medications and procedures. One such procedure was the transorbital lobotomy. Dr. Walter Freeman brought this practice to American institutions, and he revised it to shorten the surgery time. It soon became known as the ice pick lobotomy. The ice pick lobotomy was performed on patients that suffered from psychosis to depression to neurosis. Even criminals and unruly children were lobotomized. 18,000 patients in America alone. According to Ohio University, the procedure began by rendering the patient unconscious by way of electrical shock. Two electrodes were placed on the forehead to give two quick jolts directly to the brain. Once rendered unconscious, the doctor would then roll back the eyelid and insert the ice pick into the eye socket behind the eyeball to the bottom of the skull. A hammer was then used to penetrate the skull and drive the pick directly into the brain. The pick was then swiped back and forth in the frontal lobe of the brain. Patients were sometimes left catatonic or dead. Dr. Freeman even supervised a lobotomy on Rosemary Kennedy, the daughter of Joe Kennedy and sister to the former President John F. Kennedy. At the age of 23, Rosemary suffered from mood swings and had been declared slightly mentally handicapped. Her father thought this new treatment might help her and signed her up for a lobotomy. It has been widely reported that this left Rosemary completely incapacitated, staring at walls until her death in 2005. In 1963, John F. Kennedy signed into legislation the creation of the community mental health centers. This led the way for the deinstitutionalization of our mental health hospitals in the 70s and 80s, but left our community health centers underfunded. Today, our friends and family members that suffer with mental illness are left without proper care or funding. They may eventually end up homeless. Stuck out here on the streets, got no attorney, got no money, still looking for work. Two boys and one girl. And how come you don't stay with them? Because they disowned me. They disowned me, so here I am. A lot of women who are depressed because they are homeless due to domestic violence. A lot of people who are alienated from their families for you know whatever reason, there's a multitude, and have, um, have lost their way. So mental illness could happen to anyone. A lot of people are one paycheck away, and it's not something you learn how to do. There's laws on the book against camping out. Tarp, sleeping bags, blankets, pillows, tents, any of that's camping equipment. And if you're using that, then you're violating the law. I was raised upper middle class, and I didn't know anything about being homeless. You know, you don't. It's not something that ever occurs to you, really. The hardest thing is probably trying to help them. There's just not really anything set up to do with them. There's very few shelters. There's very little area you can send them. There's very little you can get for them. There's no money. There's no services, hardly. So. If, if you do want to help somebody, that's when it gets real hard. When it, all of a sudden you have no address, uh, the fear is, you know. Well, I have a motel room, but I can't afford to stay there all the time. Uh. Why don't you stay with your family? They don't want me to. They don't want me to.
it's illegal to sleep outside in Sacramento. So what do they do when they find people sitting outside? They issue them camping tickets, and then they have to go to court, and then they have you know get a fine that they can't pay because they have no money. Um, and I understand that we don't want people just pitching tents anywhere, but people need a place to sleep. Right, right. Without sleep, you will die. Those rooms are costing the homeless people a great amount of money. I was told $545 a month. Mm -hmm. What I saw there, I thought was criminal. I'd rather be homeless than live in an SRO when the temperatures were well over 100 for a period of time. Much better to be out on the river homeless you know, in a shade tree with a bottle of water than to be in one of those rooms, period. We've developed a whole culture with the idea that we have a revolving door. People wind up on the streets because they are disoriented, they don't have any support systems. And then, you know, you can't live on the street for very long, very successfully. So we have what's called the revolving door. Um, they go in and out of the street and institutions, both criminal justice and, and hospitals. And the only solution to that is adequate funding for these community mental health programs that we know really work and can successfully treat people so that this doesn't have to happen. In 1967, the state passed the landmark law beginning to shut the state mental hospitals and made that promise that it would fund mental health. Forty years is long enough to wait. And we qualified Prop 63 and we raised the bare minimum amount of money to run a week's worth of statewide television to talk to people about mental illness and what Proposition 63 could do. And in November of 2004, we won. The first round of the services money has, is now uh, getting out on the street mm -hmm. to many of the counties. On the prevention side, we just spent three days last week in Burlingame beginning to develop our guidelines for how we intend to spend the $200 million a year. The planning process was very cumbersome and, and, and you know, very frustrating for a lot of people. And, and I think that um, the amount of money that is initially able to go out is, is, is limited. It was intentionally limited because really the greatest frustration is we don't have enough people to do the work. Whether you're poor, whether you're rich, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your sexual orientation, regardless of who you are, you have been touched or will be touched in some way by mental illness. It's time we bring the issue out of the shadows it's time we start talking about it, and most importantly, it's time that we put the resources forward to help people live with mental illness instead of be cast aside and have no chance at a decent life. Uh, and I don't care what kind of work I do, uh, but I gotta take care of my family.